our lifetime, both of these phones have been considered at the cutting edge of technology. Now, how many of you would prefer that smartphone? Raise your hand. OK. My parents, they're probably a little more comfortable with the slightly older phone. And these two phones represent the different ways in which we approach life. When they want to talk to someone, they actually give them a call. When we want to look up a movie to see, they go to the newspaper, and I go to Google. When we're lost, they search for the right map out of the thousand crammed into our glove compartment, and I go to Google Maps. My instincts consistently lead me to the internet when I want information or clarification. And I think many of you have the same experience. So for many of us, the internet is a very helpful tool. Only sometimes it isn't. Because without an introduction to a concept or a foundation to work with, if we don't know what information we need, why we need it, or why what we're currently doing or thinking is incorrect, we're not going to go search for it. Our habits, our customs, our social norms can prevent us from searching for or using information that would better our lives. But that's why we have education. Because education provides us with that introduction. And it doesn't need to teach us everything there is to know about a concept, because we can go out and search for that information on our own. A few years ago, my father was diagnosed with diabetes. It was around Christmas time, and we were visiting one of his friends from college. Usually, as the daughter, it's really fun to listen into those conversations, because they exchange old college stories and jabs at each other. But this time, it was very serious, because my father's friend was telling him how concerned he was for my dad's health. He felt like my father's habits, his lifestyle, his perceptions on diet weren't going to adapt to this new medical condition, and we weren't going to be able to spend that much more time with him. At one point, he turned to me and said, you need to prepare yourself for losing him. I was barely an adult myself, still in college, and all of a sudden, I started to consider the future in ways I never had before. I realized I had taken for granted that my father would be there for many of my life's most important milestones and that that might not be true anymore. So I turned myself into an in-house fitness guru. I came up with nutritional plans and exercise guides. I chipped in to buy him an exercise bike, and I nagged him constantly about his diet and his lifestyle. Because I was terrified that if I didn't do something, if he didn't change, we wouldn't have that much longer together. My father's medical problem is an introduction I had to my passion in nutrition and dietary health, not only in the issues it can cause for us, but the ways it can make us feel better and improve our lives. Now, this is an image I think many of you might recognize. It's the American Food Pyramid. If you went to public school in the United States like I did, it'd be pretty hard to forget it. It was drilled into our heads from elementary school to high school, from our classrooms to our cereal boxes. And it's a very simple introduction to nutrition, but a very helpful one. Because it was the first time we realized different foods had different nutritional properties. And we need a variety of them to have a healthy diet and a healthy life. Even in today's world, where there's hundreds of different diet plans, and I live in New York, where we seem to invent a new one every week, even in that world, the food pyramid is still helpful to us because it introduced us to the idea so we can go out and search for more information about nutrition if we want to. Most importantly, it taught us that dietary health is something we should care about. So I took my interest in nutrition with me when I became a Fulbright Fellow in Shangxi Province, northwestern China. I spent my first few months there exploring rural areas and talking with parents, students, and teachers about the issues they face and the lives that they lead here. I worked a lot with these Chinese researchers who do amazing development work in these villages. And one of the things they taught me is that child malnutrition is still a very serious issue in rural China. But it's no longer about the calories, it's about micronutrients. A third of the students in Shangxi were anemic. Many of them were physically stunted compared to their urban peers. And many more of them were suffering from undiagnosed malnutrition problems. Now, I thought this situation was a bit surprising because China's the second largest economy in the world. I've been to cities like Beijing and Shanghai that had better subway systems than we do here in the United States. I had also spent a good amount of time in rural China, and I like to cook, so I visit the marketplaces. I'm a thrifty cook, so I like to cost compare. 
These are farming communities. They had many varieties of fruits, vegetables, grains, proteins, nuts, seeds. And they were affordable, given the family incomes in that area. The third factor was, even in rural China, there's internet access, thanks to mobile phone technology and places like this, internet cafes. The more time I spent there, the more I started to notice more specific issues. For example, parents of anemic children didn't know what anemia or iron are. In addition, the bulk of a child's meal tended to be white rice or noodles. And I should point out that many of the noodles made in China were made from regular flour, not the enriched flour that we have in the United States, which provides extra minerals into our diet. This is an example of one of the dishes that children in this area frequently ate. It's called yopo mian. It means boiling oil noodles. And while it might not be very nutritious, it's very delicious. But as you can see, not much protein and barely any vegetables. If you're eating this for several meals a day or several meals a week, you could see how there might be a problem. Well, the thing that scared me the most was that people tended to wash their raw meat. Now, I'm a horror buff, and one of my favorite movies is Poltergeist from the 1980s. And there's this scene where the raw meat is climbing onto the kitchen counter by itself. And that's kind of the image that entered my head every time someone told me they did this. This contaminates your kitchen surfaces and contaminates other food. It can make people very sick. And it wasn't just people in rural areas who had limited educational opportunities who did this. It was the urban undergraduate and master's degree students that I was working with who thought this was a good idea. So my question was, why is it that kids in a community that has plentiful and affordable food are still malnourished? Why is it in a community where there's internet access, parents still don't know what anemia is, even though a quick internet search would reveal that information? So one day I'm talking about this with one of my Chinese researcher friends. We're talking about why we got interested in nutrition in the first place, and I was telling him about the American system. We learned about the food pyramid in school. And he said, oh, that's interesting. The Chinese system, we have a food pyramid too. It's more of a food pagoda, but it's the same thing. But they don't teach it in schools. And I said, oh, that's interesting, because a third of your students are anemic. I think it might be a good thing to talk about at one point. He explained that the schools and the government thought that was the responsibility of the family to provide that information. The problem is, if the grandparents don't have that information, if the parents don't have it, they can't provide that to their children. So instead, they end up relying on these proven through time tactics, like feed your kids mostly white rice and noodles. It's cheap, it fills them up, and it's very plain tasting, so they're not going to complain about it. Those tactics and habits can, over time, become problematic. If that's all you're eating, you're very likely to be malnourished. So I proposed to this friend what I thought was a pretty boring idea. Let's start a health class. It's so commonplace here in the United States, but you know, you teach the kids, maybe they'll teach their parents, maybe the schools will learn something and start providing better food in cafeterias. Well, he thought it was a great idea, and so did the director of his research center, so they helped me actually do this. We created a health class, we went to southern Shangxi province to a county called Ningxian, and taught it in rural schools. We taught it to fifth graders, we taught it to their parents, and we taught it to their cafeteria workers. This is an example of our student workbook. We've got these cute little animals to represent the different food groups, so kids have an understanding that they need a balanced diet, not just rice, not just noodles, but also your vegetables, your proteins, your fresh fruits. Now, our program certainly encountered obstacles, one of which I think American educators and parents can identify with, was that children, once they could identify the differences between healthy and unhealthy foods, still preferred the junk food because it tasted better. But despite these issues, our program had an impact. And I know this not just from the dietary journals and nutritional knowledge exams that we collected, but from talking to the parents, students, and teachers involved in the program. And what they told me time and time again was, I still have questions about the more specific issues in nutrition, like the specific properties in minerals or vitamins. But now I know what I don't know. And now I know that the diet of my child, or my diet, affects my long-term health outlook and it's something I should care about. Our program didn't teach them everything there was to know about nutrition, but it didn't need to. It gave them that introduction, and now they can use their internet access. They can use their community resources to go out and grab that information for themselves. The question you might be asking yourselves now is, why should I care? Why should I care about the diet of some kid out in rural China? 
no matter how adorable they are. The reality is, this disconnect between available information, knowledge, and empowerment doesn't just happen in rural China. It happens all over the world. It happens here in the United States, and it happened in my family. Now, I'm very happy and lucky to say that my father made that connection recently. He started using the information sources that his doctors and that I provided, going out and grabbing knowledge for himself off the internet, and changing his habits, his perceptions on diet. He accepted the idea he could eat one vegetarian meal a day, and that is a major change for him. But there are millions of people around the world who still haven't made that connection with. Every single one of us knows someone who could use information that's already available to deal with a medical diagnosis, to fix something that's broken, to build something that's new, or to improve their lives in some other way. So what I want you to remember from this talk is, in a wireless world, the key is not just to bring knowledge, but to spread awareness, to recognize that we have to push past our experiences and overcome the force of our habits and our culture and our social norms. We need to dare not just to think, but to think beyond ourselves. Thank you.